Matt, this is your home, so why don't you introduce yourself first? My name is Matt Gleason, and I uh, am having a quadruple espresso at Barbara's at the Brewery, a fine food and beverage establishment in downtown Los Angeles. Well, Lincoln Heights. Is Lincoln Heights downtown? It's Los Angeles. It is Los Angeles. 90031. Whoa. Google Maps, that one. And my friend Jack Rettberg here. Jack, tell us about yourself. Well, that's who I am. Uh, <laughs> Jack Rettberg. Uh, I'm an art dealer here in Los Angeles uh, with a gallery on La Brea Avenue and have been doing this for about 35 years against all odds. You've been doing live internet broadcasts live, for 35 live. years? I was a pioneer. So Fred Flintstone, when you interviewed him on your first... It was incredible. The tablets were amazing. Yeah, <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay. Uh, the chisels. It was so hard to carry the chisels. But uh, in any event, uh, been on La Brea Avenue for 28 years, which I like to say makes me officially one of the La Brea Tar Pits Ooh. by the L.A. standards. So uh, anyway... Here we are, and here come our napkins. Morning, good mantras. morning, good morning. Hi, good morning. And okay. we're this. This sort of reminds me, you know, years ago there used to be the uh, what was it live at the music center? Oh and yeah. It was radio, and they would have these interviews with composers and singers and and performance. Wow. <laughs> hey! <laughs> what is that? Okay. Hey, the plants are real here. <laughs> they are. The rest of it isn't, but it's like most... It's all it's like welcome to L.A. Yeah. You came out here to kick yeah. some ass, and you found there was no ass to kick. Right. But we're, we're sitting here on this very warm summer day with forest fires blazing uh, behind us somewhere, and uh, hopefully that'll all clear up. But it's, it's lovely here, a bit warm, but... Uh, Our Tiki Hut is in very little danger of no, joining I, Mount Wilson I, in I its think we're okay. demise. But we're supposed to be talking about Los Angeles and the contemporary art scene, whatever that happens to mean, because I still haven't been able to identify something as amorphous as L.A. or the art scene, and the two oh. together are pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, uh, and, you know, for a lot of people that may be onto this website, they may not even know about the brewery and what it represents. And for that matter, Coagula, which may be a new publication to a lot of people. I think it'd be very interesting to give them a little background on that. Oh, um, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, uh, uh, a counter to the popular perceptions uh, in the fine art industry. And as such, I'm not necessarily the person you want to invite to a pleasant discussion about your art investments. But we didn't, we didn't say anything about pleasant here. Oh, well, OK, <laughs> in that case. Um, yeah, I, I've been publishing this magazine, although there's really not magazines anymore. So I... Journal. Am, 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 well, no, I mean, there's, there's information, and the way that it is, it is produced and distributed has been radically altered in the last six weeks. Uh, I mean, pardon me, six years. So, um, you know, there are ways to get out the word of, uh, about any subject. Right. And um, much like... Uh, for you in the retail side of things, you like to be called retail. Is that good? It's, no, it's that's pretty really bad. Kind of an awful, uh oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> okay. We we um, we're we're more than a boutique. There are an awful lot of boutiques, art boutiques in Los Angeles. I don't consider uh, our establishment that. Uh, we've done more to champion art and sustain it and sustain artists' histories and, and uh, make a case for the things that uh, I feel very strongly about. So it goes way beyond just a mere boutique dynamic, you know, and I, retail implies that. So uh, I'd say the museums are more retail than I am. <laughs> uh, you well, know, their bookstores have a bigger budget than probably most of the galleries combined in this town. So, so you know, it, it's, it's all a matter of how do one hey, identifies look. it? 
food is coming. Food is coming. Food is right. This will be a bit awkward, but we'll dip in here as we can. Thank you. Wow. You're welcome. What wow. happened to my TV table? My <laughs> I need my TV tray. That's an astounding and That's beautiful That's a pretty plate. amazing chicken but, pasta uh, you got yeah, there, yeah. Jack. Well, that's typical. I ordered it all off the menu. <laughs> but, and well, anyway, you know, I'm I'm kind of curious. Uh, uh, if, I want to go back to a little bit about Coagula because one of, one of the things that when they asked me who would I like to sit with, and I thought, well, who would be brave enough to be irreverent when it requires it, and I, and uh, and honest about their feelings about the LA art scene, and Matt, one of the things. Uh, is that you've certainly been both uh, honest and irreverent. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't take much, though. I mean, you just look around at what you see and talk about it. There's a, there's a, myth, a myth, a legend, that there is a, a protocol in the art world, and that if one adheres to this protocol, one will get ahead. And uh, what, in reality, the adherence to that protocol produces is an assurance uh, of anonymity. And so I've never adhered, well, I can't say never, I have worn nice clothes and taken a shower when going to a party with museum trustees. That's some protocol that might help. So I can't say, I've never read it, that's uh, a load. But there are many lessons that people will try to give you in the art world, and they will try to tell you uh, how to behave, and a lot of it is a way to minimize your ability to um, be involved. It, they, 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 they keep you a very, uh, they keep you a, an audience member rather than putting you on stage. I Who think do you maybe mean that's by a, they? Well, uh, well, maybe there is no they. I think there is a group think attitude in the art world that uh, is, tries to say, I want you in the art world because I want to make it in the art world and I want more people in the art world. And simultaneous with that, I don't want you to get any further than me. So I'm going to tell you the rules. So anytime somebody starts telling you, you know, here's how it really works, they're almost giving you a blueprint to how they didn't make it. Because every time you meet somebody who's a true superstar in the art world, most of the times they'll just shrug and say, oh, it was luck, unless they have some egomaniacal story uh, that isn't true anyway. You know, I recently gave a talk where, in the process of giving that talk, I was sort of bringing up the fact that when people say the art world, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's whose art world? Uh, look, we're, we're, we're in a, uh, the brewery, for those that aren't familiar, is a is a complex of, uh, I'm not sure how many artists, it's, studios are, it's, it's, are here. It's but 300. 300. 300. Uh, 295 of which people's parents are paying their rent. No doubt. <laughs> and, and the reality is that when one reads about the, uh, uh, I don't know, in the New York Times uh, and the, or the LA Times on, when they choose to cover art, uh, they read about, say, the art market. Is that the art world? I mean, after all, what in the world does it have to do with the artists here? What a Edvard Munch painting sells for, or if a Jeff Koons just went for half of what it, they thought it was going to bring, it really doesn't impact anyone in this, these 300 artists here, does it? Uh, it? I don't think it has anything to do with what goes on on La Brea Avenue. I mean, there, one has to identify which art world. You, you know, uh, for those that aren't familiar with publications mm. like, um, uh, say, Art Business News, which deals with a kind of pedestrian, decorative world that maybe you might see Leroy Neiman Prince you mean, advertising. You mean the dark secret that more interior decorators buy art than any other single category? Well, that's exactly right. Okay. That's, you know, but the point is that Art Business News versus Art Forum versus Art News and Art in America, these are parallel universes that often never intersect. So one really has to talk about what art world. I, I myself am more interested in a kind of a historic continuum. Mm -hmm. So when I'm dealing with a contemporary artist, I'm, I'm thinking about someone that 
you know, you stand in front of this picture or sculpture and really get awestruck by it, be humbled by it, something that will sustain over centuries that I would like to think will be so consequential that people 200 years from now will stand in front of it and glean the same sort of experience that I have. That's a powerful dynamic. I mean, it, it kind of, it, in some remarkable way, offers me just a tiny bit of immortality in knowing that I'm involved with something that had a life before me and will have a life after me. That's quite different than the kind of performance momentary dynamic that we see in a lot of contemporary art today. Oh, well, I think that there's a lot of art that is deals with the moment. And one of the reasons that the art deals with the moment and is not interested in lasting is that Art schools, which are very popular and have been very popular and have been very powerful and, and continue to be so, um, are populated, there's a student class and a faculty class. And the faculty class are people who have big careers or quasi-big careers and they are interested in um, keeping those careers from the students. And so they're teaching the students, oh, make inconsequential art. Make art that is about nothing. I think you give them much too much credit. Who? The, uh, the, they, they, that's what they're teaching them deliberately. I just don't think they have the ability to teach more than that. No, no, no. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a big... It's, it's, there are exceptions to that, by the way. I, I have a huge regard and high regard for a great many art teachers and academics. But as a, as an, as a broader institution, I think they're the, they're, they're the blame for the demise of... Art I have no are. regard for art for <laughs> art educators. I have no regard for art institutions. I have no regard for any of the art schools. Well, we have to give the exception to those. Few, the, the, you know, it, we really it, do. It is They're, by it is almost by accident that anything good comes out of I, an art I don't school disagree. in Southern California. I don't disagree. And the reason is the teachers are absolutely mortified about the students becoming their commercial competition, and if you can get the students focused away from making art of substance um, of any high caliber quality as far as the actual craftsmanship you can actually kill your competition before it emerges oh i think that's far too paranoid I th and i think it, as i say i think it gives he them much me paranoid much, i think it gives them too much credit you know these teachers don't see them as competitions because oh, no. They, no you know why i say that because most of those teachers have never achieved in the broader uh, realm other than within academia, which is, would be noble in and of itself. You know, to be a great teacher is a noble, noble There, there are no great teachers well, in the art schools today. Well, I don't, I, I, I don't disagree in terms of the generalization. I think there are exceptions. And, but there have always been those exceptions. But the academy today has been co-opted by people who have failed, and the institutions themselves are merely diploma mills on a very high level. I couldn't agree with you, you know, more. And, and we're, so we're actually in agreement. I just think, I think you go further than I do, because I still find well, hope in the exception. I'm quite, I'm quite prepared uh, to, be, to lead the charge to destroy the existence of these uh, institutions, and, and I do believe diploma mills is a perfect example where you have dozens every year dozens and dozens of MFAs do you know that thousands do you know that I ask <laughs> I ask one question of every time I meet somebody who has who's recently graduated from a local Los Angeles art school and I, I ask the same question and I invariably get the same blank stare I say oh it's a foolish question but it's it's a way to prove to me at least that these people have no perception or relationship to art history and no I say I say what school did you go to and they tell me whatever school they went to I say the same thing I say didn't Morris Lewis go to that school <laughs> And they don't know who Morris Lewis is and Morris Lewis is is just an he is just a major enough artist that he's in every museum collection right. and you can't avoid a Morris Lewis because they're about 60 feet long and about 40 feet high so you 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 if you don't know who Morris Lewis is you are missing 
a small but critical gap in the contemporary uh, the evolution of contemporary art. No, the, the, the contemporary realm today, and not just students, but, but just the art that's being made, is really a kind of a childlike version of this, a grown-up version of this childlike dynamic of look at me, look at me. <laughs> they just mm -hmm. want to be seen. It has nothing, it's, it's kind of the difference between an actor and an actress who are so steeped in the history of theater and film versus the person that just wants to do commercials and be seen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all fine. You know, so everyone deserves a paycheck, and but we can't continue to confuse the notion of people who make stuff versus artists. You know, artists, artists and poets and writers have been the conscience of our history for a great, great, great many years. And I'm really fearful that we have destroyed an entire generation of thinkers and political and social activists who, because they've never contemplated anything but the momentary sensation, uh, mm. that we, we've been deprived in these days of the kind of dynamic that has happened if you, in years past. If you think too hard, though, you're saying, wait a minute, I'm paying 70 grand a year to go to this MFA program well, that's, that's going to, you see, they don't want you to think. They no, want That's, it. of course, the they're, problem. They're modeled. Graduate schools are art graduate schools. I can't speak to the business programs nor the political science programs, but they are modeled after summer camps. You, you show up, you get your little... You get your counselor, you have, you do some projects, and then you go home to mom and dad who paid the bill. Well, and, and they've gotten a, just an astounding glide on what it takes to be an artist. Today, one merely needs the curriculum and the declaration that one is an artist. They don't have to make anything. Mm -hmm. uh, art schools uh, have become these centers, it's kind of social welfare for a cultural and social elite, in a sense. Um, and, you know, you go to school and people have sold this bill of goods that the conceptual, this virtual aspect, trumps the actual. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing, you know, when you keep something as amorphous as something that's conceptual, then it's a, it's a moving target. You can never argue it, you can never challenge it. And I've really, I feel I've coined the solution. I really have the solution in all, this entire realm of the conceptual art world. And that is what we really need is a museum of philosophy. And that all of these conceptualists should be placed in these halls, these institutions, these philosophical realms, and the vacuum of their ideas will implode to where what we actually see is who is left standing, and profundity will reign. But the, uh, it's just too easy and out today, and curators and museums are all product of this act, the academy. They're all, you know, the way I see curators today is the way they curate oftentimes in terms of contemporary art work is like this. They're looking over their shoulder. Who should they be looking at? The, you know, I would love to see the conviction and backbone of a curator who has a sustaining interest in an artist. But they're involved in show business. They are doing the show. It happens. It moves on. They're on to the next. You know, a dealer like myself, we make, in, in the ideal, we make a commitment. We say, this is what I'm interested in, and we sustain that idea for a very, very long time. The artists that I represent, I've represented for 20 plus years. Those artists found home, and I've found home in their work, and that's a commitment. You rise and fall on that. You rise and fall on that, you know? And that's something that is lacking in this city. In this city, you have galleries and artists, and these galleries are mere stepping stones. They're not the places that artists want to end up in. They are places that they want to emerge from. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's partly because we don't, nothing has importance in a city where everything is as ephemeral. Nothing is important here, and particularly our history. You know, L.A. has, and I think you have to talk about history, because 
Well, my, my problem with talking about history, though, is history can be manipulated. It can be manufactured. And, and I, I changed my mind on this subject a couple of years ago. I saw a documentary on rock and roll. And the documentary was interesting, and they, they had the evolution right. of you know right. Elvis. Right. To, right. But they couldn't secure the rights to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But they didn't say that they couldn't secure right. the rights to the they Beatles. They just left them out. <laughs> they just left right. the Beatles out. Good. Well, this is where, this is, you, you know, you're right. History is not a fixed thing. It's not. The problem in Los Angeles is that's the way it has been packaged, this mm. ephemeral mythology. But what, what history really is, is my history which is absolutely real, your history, which is separate from mine, which is, abs if you have convictions about something, that's very important, and it takes a third and fourth and fifth party to bring these things together, mm -hmm. because the word, is, it's, it was pointed out to me, very, very interestingly to me, the word when we go to school and we learn history, that's nonsense. It should be called histories. Whose history are we talking about? The They're, winners. It's, it's about the winners. It's about who's <laughs> controlling the podium. <laughs> but, but the one thing, you know, and I, and I remember years ago there was a show that happened at, uh, it was a traveling exhibition of California Expressionism, Bay Area Expressionism particularly. I think it was at Laguna Art Museum. And there was an artist here in L.A. who said to me, Jack, that show is just utter bull. This wasn't the experience. I was there. That was the experience of the GIs that came back and they were on the GI Bill and they had all this money to buy paint and all this and that. And they were, you know, uh, the, the people that came out of the Institute. Yeah, yeah. He says, we were struggling. We bled for every brush stroke that we have. We were, you know, but it, this is not our, my history. I don't recognize what was written. I said to him, look, that was true history. What it didn't, it was an aspect. And I said, you know, I remember it was a profound experience for me. When I, I went to the Amazon once and I climbed this incredible banyan tree, it was an observation deck, and every 20 or 30 feet, it was an enormous tree, you had an entire different reality. Different vegetation, different flowers, different insects. So whose experience was this? You know, the aerial view is quite different than the view on the ground. And, and, and the problem in this town, it's all been made into a sound bite like everything is in these days. So history Jack, is Jack really went, important. Jack went to the Amazon. I went to Echo Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, they've lost all of their you know, foliage. You know. <laughs> but uh, but, it, but it, it, it is that way. And, you know, in Los Angeles, we live this mythology about, say, the Ferris Gallery. Uh, Ooh, I, I, you but know. I don't. No, and, of course and, not. And I think that, that... But that's because you, you No, know but it's better. not just me, though. But it's, it's as packaged as it is, the, one of the ironies, I believe, about this myth about the Ferris Gallery, the myth about this happened and then that happened, is, is the inevitable championing of boring art and people's buddies over secondary artists that were much more interesting, it bites itself in the rear because people end up looking at just very dull art, very unexciting art, and saying, to hell with it. They're not interested in it anymore. Well, boring or otherwise isn't... The, my, my issue is that the institutions give a certain license and direction to those academicians that we talked about, to the students that look to them naively for that kind of guidance. And it takes a great deal to rectify or expand the dialogue. History is always rewritten. Contemporary history has never well, been accurately written. And, and, and you know, I, ever. It's what, what we have now. You were talking earlier about art 200 years from now. I'm pleasantly convinced that uh, the garbage that is championed now is not going to be around. I, I agree. And the other day I went to an exhibition. I wonder if you've seen the new uh, permanent collection of uh, MoCA, uh, if you've seen that yet. I've seen the damn permanent collection yeah. 50 no, no. frickin' times. Do I need but to see it again, yes, Jack? actually you do. I do? Yeah, i tell you why. Why? I walked in uh, on, on Monday, just this past Monday, and the first half of the exhibition 
is uh, goes through what a lot of people would call the old chestnuts. Great Chamberlain, Linda Bangless, uh, Judd, which I, I, okay. I is not my thing, although the Chamberlains were, were pretty compelling. And then it opens into a magnificent room that I was taken aback by. And it was the an, a room completely enveloped by Rothko paintings. Now, Rothko is so familiar to us. We think we've done it. We know it. But it's kind of like looking at pictures of food. At some point, you have to taste it. And I sat there and tasted them. And I went up to them. And I sat on a on a, on a, on a bench. And let I was steeped in 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 their presence. And I went on, and it went past Pollock and Olashinsky and and and. Uh, uh, Klein and etc. And all of these things were in this one room, which I, there was this remarkable dialogue with. One could argue, one could, one could engage them and be engaged by it. But then I went to the recent acquisitions. It was an interesting lesson to see the museum cut in half of the recent acquisitions. And if you went to the recent acquisitions, for me at least, there wasn't a single thing that captivated me. In fact, it all felt like evidence of someone having been there. You know, it's like a moving van leaves the building. It's merely evidence of a presence. But there was nothing there that was intended to capture my awe, to have a dialogue with. They were just, you know, shards along the way for me. By the way, out of the, I don't know how many works were there. It might have been 150 works. I don't know if there were more than two or three paintings in the whole bunch. But this is kind of emblematic of the difference between something that sustains the, 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 hundreds of years versus the, the fleeting. The reason that that museum has those Rothkos mm. is not the reason that you enjoyed them. Your enjoyment of them was completely oh, incidental. That's right. To them, Rothko is just another label much like the trendy labels in the current thing. And they wouldn't be able to articulate the power or the, the enjoyment one could have with a Rothko. But, and it's, when you talk to somebody from MoCA, it is exactly like talking to somebody at the Bellagio Gallery of Fine Art. When you, when you go to the Bellagio Gallery of Fine Art, they, Which I have not been. Well, I, I've, I've gone there a number of times and they've had some decent shows. Yeah. And if you talk to people there who are very well educated in the show and what's going on in the artworks and the artists in the show, they will veer within 90 seconds to talking about the price. Mm. Mocha will talk about the price. Mm. They will bring up the price tag. They will bring up the auction record. They will bring up the... When they say historical importance, it always matches commercial importance. Auction record. So Rothko... Uh, Jack, put up a Rothko at auction just to find out for well, your own edification course, course. how fun it can be. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we, we know that. But you know, listen, you know, the, the world and civilization, sadly, for right or wrong, has celebrated the importance of works uh, and and have put a price tag on the value uh, you know on their on their in, intrinsic value that's unfortunate and we know i certainly know that there are astounding masterpieces in this world that are nearly valueless in terms of monetarily oh yeah or undervalued i don't function that way so you know and privately, if you, if you had some of those curators, some, in an unofficial capacity, not as, a, not as the part of this corporate institution, but in a private moment, some of them actually know the difference. I, and are I have hugely... Yet, but listen, I have yet they, to see that. Well, I, <laughs> I think the sad thing is that their convictions are trumped by their corporate allegiances and the pressures of show business and trustees and, and running a business. But I have seen those people in private moments. Listen, I, I'll never forget, I did an exhibition. May God be my witness, this is the absolute truth. Oh, you said God never be your witness. witness. <laughs> uh, oh, there he is. 
I represent a painter by the name of Patrick Graham, who is a, a powerful, poignant Irish painter, and I've represented him for since the mid-80s. So, you know, 20 plus years. And I'll never forget when Howard Fox came to see, who was the curator of the LACMA, and he said, you know, Jack, he said, and this is not something curators typically would say. He says, I, I want you to know, hey, Lynn. Um, he said, I want you to know you have a major artist on your hands here. I said, you know, Howard, I know you don't get a chance to say that too often, and I appreciate you saying it. I said, so let me ask you a question, and let me preface this by saying, I know I'm not going to sell the museum anything. I said, how aggressive could I be with a patron and say to them, gee, Howard Fox would love it if the museum gave it. It's a pay so yeah. give that painting or that painting or that painting, etc. He says, you know, Jack, you know, the museum has its priorities and we're busy with bullshit like Jeff Coons. This is right after they did that avant-garde show where Coons was really introduced mm -hmm. with a lot of other artists and so forth. This is pretty early on. But this is the problem. You see, they don't function on their convictions. They function by a world order of collegial impressions and media. It's become an issue of power and money. And, and trustees will dictate matters and the art world. Well, what is that art world? I don't know what that art world is. And I've been doing this for 35 years and I'm not a moving target. One can identify what the hell I do as opposed to a museum that might have shown Farrah Fawcett at the expense of how many extraordinary artists that have not gotten their due at the LA County Museum and Farrah Fawcett was given an exhibition of her work. So, I, you know, I don't know where... And the sculptures of her didn't even get the nipples right. <laughs> well, I see your bias. <laughs> One thing for me, and I know where you're going with this, or where you've arrived at in this argument, my situation has always been, I, I'm not going to wait around for those institutions to say, okay, now it's time to validate what you like. Now it's time to give you a crumb. Um, I went out and just started my own art magazine so what I notice, and you have your own gallery, obviously, you know, um, so people are not, the LA art world is not doing its own thing. The LA art world is marching in lockstep in the hope of getting up the escalator to the top tier, but it's an escalator to nowhere when you are being directed by nobodies. And so um, I think the, the need for validation from these institutions is a complete falsehood relative to the fact that great things can occur and even if they don't make it into art history, TM, even if they don't make it into the dialogue, circle R, it's still important for us as human beings to create our own culture which is why I reject the lodestone of history, because when I have people telling me, this is what happened, and then somebody else, and like your friend there, saying, that's not what happened, this is what happened, I don't care what happened. I care what's happening now. Well, but context, context has value. I, I, you, I, don't, I, you know, Jack, I, I, I don't, don't believe in does. context. Mm. Think about this. Think about this. Robert Reynolds can't keep his goddamn phone. We have to mute our phones to be on camera. And Robert Reynolds, Robert Reynolds can't keep his goddamn phone. Hey, your, mic, your mic and my mic seem to be... Hey, Lynn, do you have a cell phone? To... No, I don't have Okay, <laughs> we, have a, we have an exclusive here. Get the camera back on us. We have an exclusive. Lynn Folks does not have a cell phone. Okay. <laughs> or a computer. Okay. Well, I, I but I, I, no, no, really, no, okay, I okay. really reject I'll, your notion that, that no, no, history I, has no value. No, no, no I don't say history had no value. I just said that history is used more to bludgeon and control people oh. than it is used to educate them. Well, I, and, and, and I think that history the... History changes, though. I, I, I disagree. The, I, I really, the idea that... What is context? Context is putting somebody in the mindset that this plant right here 
is the most important plant. It is part of the historical dialogue. Now, contextually, yeah, it's just a plant. Well, you're talking about but a hierarchy. This was the plant that was in between Jack Rutberg and I on this historic date at this historic place. And see, this is what people do with rationalizing why one splash of paint We value is, the things that we treasure. And whether it's people, but, whether it's relationships, but, but, whether it's objects. And for mm -hmm. these things are charged the, with an experience that sustain us. It's, I disagree I believe with, that the word context is a way to manipulate oh, those values. Let me give values. you context. Okay. When you were walking down the beach with your girlfriend and that beautiful day for the first time and you saw a shell uh -huh. and you picked up that shell mm -hmm. Not because it was some magnificent mm -hmm. specimen, but you take that shell home and you put it on your windows, windowsill. Uh -huh. She may be more romantic. She might have done this instead of you. But, but the point is, it's the reason of the importance of that shell is through that shell is charged a remarkable experience mm -hmm. that you can sustain and capture. So when you see a, a, a say, a, a, a calder, sculpture, or rather, excuse me, not a sculpture, but a, a, a gouache that seems so, or painting that seems so simple, a few balls that are merely just suspended. Mm -hmm. The reason that might have value for someone is because through that simple statement, through that sentence, comes the entire encyclopedia of his work from someone who is knowledgeable and that experience is charged through that work and people value it and people place value on that when when mom and dad monetarily speaking. when mom and dad die the kids go into the bedroom and they look for the jewelry and where they hid the cash and that fucking shell on the shelf is hot get tossed in the trash you, you know what it wasn't their experience. But they well, had no but, context. Okay, which is why I'm looking at his, history, and I'm looking at three ugly paintings from 1940 and saying, this is fucking history? This is important? This thing's worth $2 million? Kiss my Forget ass. Forget about the $2 million. You know what? Things have gone through time. No, 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 no. I'm, being told, uh, no, no. I'm being told by the institution that part of the reason this is on the wall is because it is valued for $2 million. And they, not only are they creating the context, they are taking the actual market as the context. You're, you know what you're confusing? What you're am I confusing? confusing a marketplace and art. No, no, and but, those are two different things. Who, I have yeah, to, who I doesn't have to, though? I have who doesn't to mitigate. Though? No, no, I, I participate in that world. I have to mitigate those differences. But when we talk about art, when now we talk who's about in, now who's no, in La La Land, about, theory well, land? Listen, you know what? That has, that theory land, that La La Land is the thing that has sustained me to do what I've done for 35 years, not only monetarily, but psychically, emotionally, because if I were just doing the thing as a businessman, I would have done a very different thing as an art dealer. I would have taken the easy course. Instead, I've championed some of the most challenging you should have real estate. Well, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, one of the things that you and I have always, uh, I've always respected you because you were, your irreverence goes to the core. But, I always, and I've told you this before off camera, I think oftentimes you go too far because your target is the institution right or wrong. I would rather say the institution. Oh, okay. I want to target I the institution wrong. I, I, I am. The difference between a libertarian and an anarchist <laughs> is the libertarian an knows anarchist. that they want their tax dollars to actually pay to have the streets paved, yeah. and a fucking anarchist doesn't care. Right. So yeah, right. I think I think. And, and you know what? I, I, I drive a, a car that I love, the smooth ride. I paid a lot of money for that car, by the way. Okay. So I, I'm a real capitalist here, and I just love that damn smooth hmm. street, and I'm willing to pay, and I hope you're paying those taxes. I want the pothole filth, but truly, I mm -hmm. am pissed off as hell at institutions all around us. But you know what? It's like the old bumper sticker. America, you know, they said love it or leave it. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Love it and change it. Well, and that's, that's the mission that anyone who has any conviction about what they are doing that's the thing that sustains them. And that's what I look for in an artist, that conviction, that absolute passion, that point of view, and 
a unique vision that's worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. In the end, listen, I'm only here for a short while. History, back to history, will determine when the cream rises and falls. Well, I think that front room that I mentioned at MoCA will sustain the, the new recent acquisitions that they put their money into and said, somebody, some curator had to say, my God, we have to have that above all else. We have to have that. I don't get it, and it won't be there for long. In 200 years, MoCA will be a mosque, and they will be saying, it is so great that we can now have prayers where once the infidels had their graven images on the wall. Well, you know, there is... That's a, history. There is a place for, for the shrine. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys. What can I tell you? I fall to my knees. I, I know what it is to get religion from a picture. Maybe you never have. Oh, no, no, no. Where I live, there's Lady of Guadalupe's on the, on the neighborhood walls all over the place. I know all about that's the a, image. That's, that's an icon. That's something. I'm talking about the substance. The, there's a, a mark. But there's, they're better painted than 99% the, of the art. They, than, they, no, they can tell be. You. I'm not diminishing that. Okay. That's a symbol. For most people, it's not the quality of the of the of those uh, those uh, ladies of Guadalupe. It's it's a reference to something that is a touchstone for them on another level. Okay. I'm talking about the mark making of an artist, the touch that the nuance, that ephemeral thing that we call quality, would, which will be different for everyone. But that's the thing that is captivating and an extraordinary thing. Listen, I I think that nuance is the single thing that is missing from our society today. I think that's a huge problem. Uh, you know, I'll go back to, uh, let's talk about me. <laughs> I, I, I'll go back to, listen, I've championed an artist who I think is one of the giants of the 20th century. I mean it very sincerely, it's not hyperbole. And that's Hans Burkhardt, who was one of the most important artists that ever set foot in California. Came here in 1937, was part of the genesis of the American modern art in New York with Gorky and de Kooning, came to L.A. and sought an independent experience that could only be given in L.A., really. And I, and I see people coming to his shows, some falling to their knees because they don't even understand what this is. They've, they've been brought up on a video monitor, and when they see paint and nuance, they don't even know how to read it. They have no vocabulary. But you know what? They understand that it is, there is something there. So what you're saying, well, let, me, let me see yeah. if I get you right. What you're saying is that people with no, they didn't come into your gallery mm. to see the Hans Burkhardt show because they read a book. They didn't come into to your gallery be, to see the Hans Burkhardt show because he had, a, he had a name and he was a name brand with a market value that was published and championed by institutions. I don't believe okay, that. so what you're saying is that independent of all context, People walk in and have an intense experience. It's never independent of context. They have, on some level, either experience or lack of experience with a metier, a touch, a, a material. So when they see that, it is that context and lack thereof that makes this extraordinary. For the informed painter that came in and saw this, he said, my God, I've never seen anyone paint like this. Mm -hmm. That's for the informed person. For the uninformed person, they, from a different direction, they say, this is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like this. So it's a different kind of revelation. Well, if, if you, so there is a meeting there. If you took the Hans Burkhardt painting, yeah. Yeah. Because I'm wondering, and I'll, I'll paraphrase is where yeah. I'm going with this. I'm not going to try to trick you or no, lead no, you down okay. a path okay. and ask okay. you one question and go, ha, ha, ha. Because I'm not that smart. You can trick me. <laughs> um, um, where I'm going with this is I believe that the gallery, your gallery, any gallery, and, and this is, mm -hmm. I don't mean this offensively. I just mean okay. this is the structure. A gallery setting, oh, we've got clean white walls. We're in a nice part of town. We have great track lighting. I am going to give you permission now to have a wonderful aesthetic experience, no matter what the hell, what the hell I got on the walls. And addition so, is free as a okay. consequence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get what you pay for. So if you took the Hans Burkhardt, and you've already, I believe, at least tacitly confirmed to me that one does not need to be told all of the history of Hans Burkhardt to enjoy Hans Burkhardt, which, which, whereas I would argue that 
without the price tags, the Rothkos may not necessarily have the oomph that we are giving them. We are been, we've been told so many times these Rothkos are the greatest. And, and uh, right. you know, I'm thinking color swatches at, at Walmart. Okay, I, but, won't, I won't argue you know, that okay, people but, aren't colored by that. Okay, yes, know, exactly. So people, glasses, people bring no. this into. Of course, if I take that Hans Burkhardt out of your gallery, of course I would get permission to borrow it. I wouldn't just take it out mm. of your gallery. Mm. Um, and I take it down and I put it on the wall in, in my neighborhood next to, the, to uh, the Shrine of Our Lady there on the wall. So now I've rid of all context. Mm. I've not only... Do we have the people who went right, to your gallery right. without the context that this right. is important, this is right. 1937, this is authentic, first or guy in LA. Or 1987, or 19, oh, we're, we're not talking about no, no, but, but you're saying somebody who, yeah, okay. Who, it, it has nothing to do with the genesis. Just because you were there at the beginning is not, okay. being there is not the greatest okay. attribute. No, I, I, you I, know, that's I've, a big problem. You've got to do more than show up to be an artist. I missed a party once and the cops busted it. So <laughs> being there was not being there was more important than but being there. But I took but okay. off your tag. So, so I'm my my argument at least is that, and I'll let you argue against it. I'll just state that's what okay. I'm, I'm stating here is that if you take most paintings out of this rarefied context that is completely manufactured, separate from the artist, separate from the art experience. And you put this painting, um, like I said, on a street corner or in somebody's house or garage in, in a lower class neighborhood, it loses, most art loses 99.99% of the power and transformative energy that are prescribed to it. And it is the rare artwork and there are the, there are these artworks. There are these paintings, primarily paintings. I'm with you on the painting I, I, thing. I believe that there are ones that can transcend that, and people go, "Wow!" And you get a wow out of the heir to a fortune in Beverly Hills, and you get a wow out of a janitor just off work in Huntington Park. It's been my okay. experience. Yeah, in it your is, okay. I cannot tell you. The dynamic that happens in an art gallery that no museum curator can experience. I'm there to see people come in day in and day out, and I have to engage them. A museum curator, what do they do? They host a party. They have an opening. And I'm not diminishing the work that they've done. I am. But, well, let's just say this happened to be one that you liked. But the bottom, or not, let's say it's one you haven't okay. liked. But you know what th happens? It's a lot like when you're invited to someone's home for dinner and the meal was really terrible. You leave and you say, thank you so much. Really enjoyed the evening. You're not going to go out and say, hey, food really sucked and uh, hey, too bad. So what happens is these curators do an exhibition like the Farrah Fawcett show at LACMA at that time. I, I hate to pick on poor Farrah Fawcett. But it was also it was, a Keith Edmire show. It, it, it was, but there are other shows like that. Um, that that deserve that kind of drubbing, not quite to that degree. I think there was one other one that, or two that uh, are in my memory. Everyone. But, but no, I disagree. But but the the point is that what happens is the curator hosts an evening. They are people of position. They have these sycophants and genuine supporters who are there. And what do they say? Fabulous, fabulous. Well, I've been there when they say fabulous, fabulous, and then they walk out the door and say, "What a bunch of shite," you know. The curator does not get a genuine read, but believe me, I have, and in my entire career, I don't know that I've met more than 10 great artists. I'm serious. I mean, I've met an enormous number of very were, 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 competent... Were any of these meetings done through a Ouija board? <laughs> well, you know, they might... Because you could get it up to they, maybe they 10. They might as... In my I, I, don't, I don't even think 10. I think I'm being exaggerating. <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is, um, I have experienced it and I have witnessed everyone from my postman to my FedEx person to children to people coming in and saying to me, what's happening to me? I don't understand what I'm experience, mm -hmm. experiencing. And I'd say to them, I've had the occasion. I, I, I walked into a room once. I'll never forget it. I walked into a room. There was a collectors that had never bought anything from me. They'd been here for a long, long time. And I and I they were they were in they were uh, they were in the gallery and I finally figured I should come down just to be pleasant and say hello you know it's, I always appreciate people coming and I come down and I see the husband in the far corner I don't see the wife 
because the gallery, there's a wall over here and uh, in the back. And I turn around and, and she turns, I said, you know, I said hello. And she turns around and mascara is running down her face. And, 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 she's, and she turns around and says, Jack, what's going on here? I said, well, Phyllis, I don't, what do you mean? She says, I don't know. I'm standing in front of these paintings and I'm just crying. I can't stop crying. I said, well, Phyllis, has this ever happened to you before? You go to galleries all the time. And she said, no. I said, well, guess what? You've been touched. And that's a rare occurrence for all of us in our encounters on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, I've experienced this. This isn't some ephemeral conceptual idea. I'm not interested in conceptual. I'm interested in actual. And all actual things have wonderful concepts behind them. But if it stops at the conceptual, it's not there. And that's the problem with the world today. People are confusing virtual with actual. People are going to be seeing this thing on the web thinking, wow, they know Matt Gleason and they know Jack Rutberg. Well, bullshit. We could both be, you know, hack murderers for all, you know, they know. He but, knows! <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really, I, 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 I get I, your I, point and I get your cynicism because I would argue your point almost all the time. But I think it's so important to give people the notion that there are possibilities and that's what sustains us. I, I want to get an actual discount at your gallery. Is that <laughs> done? Done. But it's all we do. <laughs> because if, I, if, if things were sold at, at their true worth ba compared to what the norm is, oh, then we no. are discount. But no, uh, you know, I, I want, I there's want to great things to celebrate in the city. The problem is that it is not part of the story. You know, well, then, but I, and I believe the reason it is kept out of the story is so that people can maintain control. And oh, sure. uh, that's, that elitism demands it. My, my pet peeve, my personal pet peeve, is if you simply look at the demographics of Los Angeles and the fact that the town is already 50% Latino and the fact that maybe in my lifetime, if uh, you don't kill me, um, <laughs> uh, it could be up to 75% Latino, I would argue that the local institutions primarily are completely ignoring a very rich, not only a rich historical tradition, uh, which in and itself is manipulated by every, uh, by every level of society. You know, you can talk to graffiti artists who will be like, you don't know your history, man. You know, Skater was a better <laughs> tagger in 1993. And, and, and you know what? That is a history. Yeah, I, it is I, not my history. But it, but it is it, not the one I want to celebrate. But, and that's where the difference but lies. It's, but it's, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but it's never brought up by anybody who's legitimately saying, yeah, this is the history. Isn't it cool? It's always brought up by somebody saying, I own the history. you got to come through me. I'm the bottleneck. But you know what, Matt? We live in a place where the official word is put out there. This is a, Los Angeles is a city of parallel universes. And we all bring our own experiences and have our own experiences. I refuse to be so cynical as to be paralyzing because I get to have those wonderful engagements that are nourishing. Jack, and you're, you're, that. you're east of the 110, I don't know. Well, you know, <laughs> it happens. It can happen everywhere. And you know what? This notion of the shiny trophy, pedestal-placed artist is nonsense. As you know, you listen, you've met artists. You know they're, they're in there. It's grunt work. They are left between them and that canvas or whatever the medium is. They are having a very private dialogue. The fact that it's private and the fact that they're bleeding doesn't make it art. Out of all those thousands and thousands and thousands of picture makers, there will always be a few artists. That's, it's always been that way. Today, you can market anything so everyone gets equal play. And it's just bullshit. It, 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 there really, uh, it has always been the world of a very, very, very few. If you get an art history book that was published in the, uh, say, which would have been contemporary, a, a book that was published in 1920s and look at their contemporary art, you won't have heard of any of those people. Where were they when Van Gogh was painting? Where were they with Soutine? Where were they with Giacometti and all these various people? There, there's it actually took a, time. It there, took time. Actually, speaking of art history, there's a Three Stooges episode that takes place <laughs> in an art school. 
<laughs> and it was actually filmed God, I missed in the mid-30s. <laughs> well, they end up getting into a fight with the paint and the clay, you know. And they sell the painting, but, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but there's not one abstract painting in, in the thing. And I'm thinking, this they actually captured on film, regardless of the antics of Larry Moe and Curly, like where the contemporary situation was. And so what happens is people look back at those history books published in the 20s or 30s and say, oh, they were wrong. They didn't include the surrealists. But for them, you know, so what, we're wrong now. We are wrong now. In fact, because there is no right. There, we are wrong. There is no, art is everything, and there is nobody... Postmodernism. No, I, I, I actually am no quite, central not a truth. fan of it at all. No, but, but you I, just articulated I, no, no, it. No, but I, 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 th that's my argument. I mean, I'm, I'm fighting against oh. that. But, but look, there is a... I can give you... I, no one has ever charted this out for me, and I've come to a, an understanding in my own mind, accurate or otherwise, I can kind of trace why L.A. is in this kind of insipid realm and how the contemporary art world followed. And that started back in the 30s and 40s, 40s really, in L.A. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. we're not no, going to go look, through look the at whole your, thing. Look at your watch. But <laughs> the, point, the, point, the point is that modern art in Los Angeles, censorship of it was virulent, uh -huh. virulent. What happened in the, where the academy shifted dramatically was after the veterans came back from the war, the GI Bill was there. They all went to art school. There was an environment where you could not teach abstraction. It was censored. The artists were literally, there were hearings here at City Hall where artists were accused of being communists because their abstract paintings were, in quotes, secret military installation maps and they were tools of the Kremlin. This was the environment. So when Artists came out of those art schools after the war and then into the 60s. They were looking for something new. They had nothing here with tooth. They, they looked east, that shiny thing, and pop art. That was easy, pop and, and this cooler sensibility because, you know what? There was no content. It was easy. It wasn't going to ruffle any feathers. It wasn't going to deal with all that censorship. So you're talking about we are suffering the fate today in this very, I, I really shorthanded this, but... We are suffering the fate today of some 30, 40, 50 years, really, really 50 years of a kind of censorship which has introduced a generation of academicians that haven't got a clue what a painting is. But they were communists! The sons of bitches should have been on their ankles and beaten with sticks! <laughs> it's probably a great place to end this. <laughs> but, but, you know... Nathan, I mean, uh, uh, listen, three, three minutes. I've got one. <laughs> I, I've got the answer, and that is really people just need to go to the galleries and argue against what they don't feel. I went to the Culver City galleries recently, and I swear to you, I thought they all went to a tattoo parlor to get their uh, uh, aesthetic chops. It, it, it's like the, re the reason. Ever no, seen but the re a the reason the people are turning to the tattoo shops and to graffiti, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying that they are. It is a reality, and the reason they are is because there are completely unsatisfying experiences at the institutions, at the galleries, in the artist studios, because everybody's in line to be a rock star for a stage right. that right. doesn't exist. Mentorship is the thing that's missing. And the only, yeah, the, only mentorship, the only mentorship is going on is when a 50-year-old, 60-year-old, gray-haired art professor can bang the 25-year-old little arts tart, you know. So I that's that one. That's the mentorship. Yeah. Well, you never see. You're not in academia. Academia <laughs> only exists for these old guys to get laid. <laughs> Oof, God, well, keep your daughters out of those art schools. They'll shut down in a week. Those guys will be like, huh? I just got to talk to guys. When I was an art, I, I was a painter 30 years ago, and the professor's like, who did this painting at the crit? Here was a crit. Some girl would raise his hand, he'd get her up there, touch her and everything. Who's, whose painting is this? Mine. Keep working hard. Next, he's looking to touch the girls. Ugh. I guess I was lucky to actually be inspired by some real artists and paintings as opposed to and those kinds of actors. Better, rather than be inspired, I have been enraged and I feel that the fuel for that fire has allowed the LA art world to glow much more brilliantly than one person patting me on the head and saying, good job. Well, 
it's your time to celebrate some substance when you find it. There isn't any. Well. All right. So goodbye. Wrap it up. I goodbye. Think. <laughs> All wrapped up. Is that it? Good night. Woo. God damn, that my back good. is killing yeah, me. That was great. I was getting really. Oh yeah. I was about to punch him.